Good morning, good morning, good morning, church family. How's everybody doing today? Amen. Another awesome Sunday, huh? Now we just need warm weather. Well, good morning and welcome all RLC family members and guests. We're so glad that you decided to join us today and we hope that you're healthy, doing well, nice and warm. For those who don't know me, my name is Dave Parker Jr. I had the privilege of being at RLC for, for many, many years. I've pretty much grown up here. This is a special place, so welcome. For those, uh, I just want to acknowledge everybody who's online. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. It's going to be a great service. We have two special people here. I'm not going to tell you yet, but you'll figure it out. <laughs> but if you're here for the very first time, welcome. Um, we are definitely glad you're here. You should have gotten a welcome brochure from a greeter when you walked in. Please fill that out completely. There's also a place in that brochure that if you need prayer, please fill that out as well because we want to be able to stand with you whatever you're agreeing for God for. So please fill that out. Immediately after service, you'll take that to the Welcome Center. You'll get a free gift. Or you can give it to one of us ushers or you can drop it off at the giving stations at the exits. Now, we have a lot of good stuff going on, coming up, so listen quick. Please join us for prayer here at RLC every Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 9.30. So that's a good start. We gotta pray about everything, amen? We have our life care uh, groups meeting with our midweek service um, here at RLC. They're Wednesday at 7 p.m. So the contact info can be found on the April calendar or the welcome desk or online and the flyer on the display. All adults are welcome. Our journey of recovery meets this Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m. If this is, oh, sorry. Not the 12th? No, oh, I'm sorry. Correction. <laughs> so this Friday, journey of recovery meets this Friday. If this is your very first time, please see Beth Petrosky or call the church. Our baby dedications uh, if, are coming up this Sunday, May 12th. If you are an RLC member with a child up to two years old and you are interested in having them dedicated, please see the church office. Attention, all men. Check out the information and register at the front foyer for the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference coming up in Albany on Saturday, May 18th. Now, let me tell you something. That's a good opportunity to get better with God. Most of you, if you've attended that um, event, it's awesome. So please sign up. It's going to be a good time, fellas. Also, stay up to date with the RLC worship playlist and stay connected. In the cafe, there is a card that you can take that has a QR code. If you scan the QR code and bring it, uh, it'll bring you right to the playlist for April. And then you can stay for a beverage. Please be reminded that all of our announcements can be found on our church app and our Facebook pages. And please follow us on any social media. More information can be found in the cafe. We always want to say thank you for your continued giving. Uh, it's a lot of what we do here. It provides for so many things and helps us do what we need to do for God. You can mail it in. You can give at the giving stations at the exits. You can give online on the website, or you can give on the church app. Now, speaking of giving, when I was first thinking about what I should share today, um, God gave me gratitude. I think if no matter what we do in life, we have to be grateful, right? It definitely makes giving to anything or anyone a lot easier. See, I am so grateful for the things that God has given me. I mean, he's given me life for almost 50 years in June. He, thank you. <laughs> he's given me strength to work a job for over 23 years, right? Church work days, work around your house, you know, lifting weights to build your body up. He, I'm extremely grateful for my wife, who loves me, who cooks for me, who teaches me, for sure. So how could I not give to her? 
I'm also grateful for my pastors who teach us the word of God every week and pose as mentors so that we know what godly men should look like. I'm also grateful for my usher team who God has allowed me to lead and they are such great people and they serve every week faithfully because they love God. So if I'm going, I feel like being grateful is essential to what we do if we're gonna be doing these things consistently. See, Psalm 107, verse one in the New King James Version says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. We should give thanks to God first and then we will gladly give our tithe, our time and our talents as a result of the gratitude for all he has done for us. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all the lives and all the situations that are gonna be changed because of the tithe, the time, and the talents. Lord, help us to give unselfishly. And Lord, we thank you in advance for all the great things that you're gonna do, all the lives that are gonna be changed, and all the things that are gonna be done according to your will. We thank you, we praise you, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, church family. Please. Stand up and join us as we sing to our lovely Father. Sing praise, sing praise, 
it's always time to praise God. Always. Because he's always worthy. And as we move our focus in praise and worship from our situation to our Savior, from the problem to the provision, all of a sudden that praise brings elevation to our lives. Amen? Aren't you glad that he is almighty God? And even gladder that he is a good, good father. Let's give him praise. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, if we have any children in here from six weeks to sixth grade, they're going to head over to the rainforest. Quest are in here today. Thanks, Louis. Louis giving me the no-go sign. So you guys are in here with us. And uh, if you would take a moment and just turn and greet somebody around you, and you can be seated. Well, you can head back to your seats. This always takes a little bit of faith because I'm not sure I'm going to get you back to, to your seats. But uh, you can pick this up at the end of service and greet some of the folks you didn't greet at this time. I have to tell you, I am really, 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 are you aware that I'm really excited? <laughs> I am really excited because we, we are so, so privileged and blessed to have a couple that have been in Debbie's in my life for decades. And they have been a part of this church for decades. 
and they have sown so much, not just into us. These, these two, Pastor Jonathan and Verna Del Turco, are incredible gifts. Just how God uses them in the body of Christ and how God has used them in Debbie's in my life. Honestly, we wouldn't have been able to be here for the time we were without the encouragement, without the wisdom, without the understanding that they have given us, without, without their support. They have been instrumental in pouring into our lives to help us to grow and pouring into this church to help this church grow. And uh, they, they haven't just done this in this church. They have done this in hundreds of churches, not just all over the United States, all over the world. And so we are amazingly privileged. We are overwhelmingly blessed to have Pastor Jonathan and Verna here today. And so if you would stand and let's thank God for the gifts that they are. Love you, Jeff. Amen. Well, good morning. While you're still standing, let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity we have to be together. Lord, we're so careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. And so, Father, we stand at a very important time in this ministry, and we're so grateful that you chose all of us. You chose all of us to be here for such a time as this. What a privilege, what an honor. And Father, I thank you for your word today that will come across with clarity, with accuracy and simplicity. I pray, Father God, that it will touch our hearts, it will inspire us, it will motivate us. Lord, I thank you that it will cause our hearts to come alive with excitement and joy. And Lord, we thank you for your plan for your purpose. We thank you that, Father, all you do is good, and we're so grateful for good. No matter how we feel, no matter uh, what goes on inside of our hearts or our thoughts and our minds, we thank you that what you do is good. Yeah. It's for your honor and for your glory. It's for the church to rise up in these last days and accomplish the important tasks that every local church has. So, Father, we give you praise today. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We look forward to, Father, your word falling on good ground today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. It's such a joy to be back with you. It's been a long time. Uh, I think the last time we were here is 2018. Hard to believe. Uh, with everything that's been going on all these years. And so it's an honor for us to be here. Not only to be here on a Sunday morning, which is a great honor, but to be here during your season of transition is an extra great honor. And I want to talk into that today and, and uh, give you some hope and some instruction, some encouragement, some faith. And uh, we're so excited to be able to, to be with you. Uh, your pastor and Pastor Jeff and Pastor Debbie are not only do we respect them for being ministers, we call them friends. And not every relationship that we have in ministry turns into a great friendship. And uh, we're grateful for when it does. It's a rare thing. Um, you got yourself some amazing pastors. You know that, right? You know that, right? And we're grateful for them. We're grateful for uh, Pastor Jeremy. He needs to get used to being called pastor. Pastor Jeremy and uh, Becky and their family. It's good to be with you. And uh, we're super excited about this season. If you have your Bibles, turn over with me, please, to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. We're going to read a, a couple of verses there in Joshua chapter 3. And uh, some context, Joshua chapter 3, the children of Israel are right now on the edge of the promised land. They've gone through their 40 years of wandering. They've gone through a season where a whole generation died off. They've gone through what was supposed to be an 11-day journey, uh, they wandered for 40 years, and here they are now, again, back in this place 40 years ago, back in this place on the edge of the Jordan River, uh, about to cross over into the Promised Land. What a big event. You can imagine the excitement. You can imagine the, the joy. You can imagine the, the trepidation. What lies ahead? You can imagine the reports they heard from their parents how many years ago, how many giants were in the land, and what they felt, and, and, and the feelings, and the emotions. And I put myself in those situations, and it's just not just a Bible story, not just true, but these are real people. 
These are real life people that have, that have a desire to obey God. Real life people that are in the process of making a major transition in their own lives. And here we find in Joshua chapter 3, 1 through 4, it says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. Since you have never been this way before. Since you have never been this way before. Right? You're about to go somewhere where you haven't been before. Is that right, church? Yes, yes it is. It says, it goes on to say, but keep a distance about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. What an exciting time as uh, Pastor Jeff has uh, made this announcement over the last two weeks about this transition process. And you understand you are being led where you have never been before. That can cause excitement. That can cause fear. That can cause all the same emotions, right? We've never been where we're going before. We've never, we've never been through a transition season like this. And many congregations are going through these types of things. And so there are many thoughts, I'm sure, going through your mind and many concerns and all kinds of thoughts that go through our minds. I want to talk to you this morning about the pioneer spirit. About the pioneer spirit. The church has never been in greater need for pioneers of all ages and backgrounds to step forward and lead the way. It's during times of crises and chaos and change that we need pioneers. It's during this time where pioneers become so valuable. People that really have an understanding of the importance of the season and the importance of that moment. Pastor Jeff and Debbie, as you well know, they're pioneers. Whether they've called themselves that or not, they are pioneers. 37 years ago, the Lord brought them here to Rome and they're not settlers, they're pioneers. And it's never been more important that, the, that an imperative that that same pioneer spirit continue more than ever. Amen. From these leaders to these leaders, that pioneer spirit. Here in Joshua chapter 3, we have two pioneers whose time has come, finally, to step out into the adventurous danger of uncharted territory. In Numbers 13, we know that originally 12 leaders were chosen, one from each tribe um, out of the land that God promised them to then now take that step and go into the promised land. And after 40 days, they all were in agreement, weren't they? They were on agreement. This is land like we've never seen before. And they, they, they thought it went over and over, and they even brought back proof of their big score. And we know the story. All 12 had the potential of being pioneers. They were the hand-picked leaders uh, from each tribe. They were the leaders of the year. We're not talking about, you know, somebody who just um, recently gave their lives to Christ or somebody who recently, you know, is brand new in the things of God. These are the leaders of the year from every tribe that came forth, amen, but only two distinguished themselves as pioneers that day. Because of the fear of the other ten, they settled in something they were never meant to be, settlers. When there's a pioneer spirit on a church, when there's a pioneer spirit on a group of people, there's nothing worse than being a settler, settling for not God's highest and best, not, you know, settling for 50% of your healing or settling for just a little bit of what God wants to give you that's so much more. And so many of us, we settle. And here these men had the capacity. They had the leadership ability. They had the people's trust. They had influence. They could have stepped up like Joshua and Caleb, but they didn't. And they shrunk back and became settlers. So many people's story. What we have here in Numbers 13 is a defining moment. A defining moment in the lives of 12 leaders who represent hundreds of thousands of people. Will they burst open into the grace of God? 
Will they, will they step over into what God promised them so many years ago? Will they, will they break the odds and go against the odds and, and, and press toward and press through their fear and press through these giants that were in the land and press through the walled cities? And will they press through what they see around them? Will they press through the obvious and the circumstances that we all face, whether they are in our minds or they're actually around us today? Amen. Or will they fold under the pressure of tormenting fear and uncertainty and lead their people into circles of unfulfilled dreams? How many people have lived in unfulfilled dreams you knew you had something in your heart, but because of fear or because of self-worth, a lack of self-worth or because of people's voices or because of um, uh, mistakes that people make or because of situations in your family, we draw back and we don't walk in God's highest and best. I've learned years ago that a faith that's not tested is a faith that can't be trusted. Right? If your faith has ever been tested, I'm sure everybody in this room, your faith has been tested by, by outside circumstances, inward circumstances, health issues, money issues, marriage issues, family issues, children. You know, that's when, when faith is tested and you come out on the other side of that faith test. Man, you know you can trust your faith. Now you got a testimony that if God did it once and God did it five times, he can do it again. Yes. Amen. See, our faith, we, don't, we, we might not like it, but our faith needs to be tested so it can be trusted. Yes. So we can take it to the next level and go further on with God and experience these miraculous seasons of breakthrough that God has provided for us. See, in order to pioneer this new adventurous season, it will require courage. Courage is something that we all celebrate, something that we admire, it's something that we honor when we see it in people's lives, when we see it lived out. Everybody wants to have courage to be able to do something that's uncomfortable or do something that's out of the ordinary or do something that, that for someone else that would take a, a courageous step uh, to, to believe and to trust and so forth. And example of courage is are all around us. And I'm sure in this church, there are plenty of testimonies of courageous people who overcome illnesses and overcome tragedies and overcome, you know, th things that broke your heart that you never dreamed you'd have to go through, but the courage to pick yourself back up and the courage to move on, right? The courage to say, I'm not done yet. Yes. Even though you feel like giving up, even though you feel like letting go, even though you feel like I can't go on another day, I just, my heart is so broken. But, but we see courage played out uh, all around us, especially in the Bible from cover to cover. Abraham left his home to journey to a place that he wasn't even sure existed. Moses overcame his speech impediment to lead the people of Israel to freedom. Joshua faced doubters who feared the promised land that was too difficult to conquer. Gideon led an army of only 300 to defeat an army of thousands. Daniel and Esther displayed tremendous courage in the face of death. Nehemiah overcame fierce opposition to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. Jesus faced the cross and triumphed over death. And Paul penned parts of the New Testament while nurturing wounds in prison. Examples that encourage us, examples that inspire us. I'm sure your story would inspire us as well. Amen. Your story is important. I like and I love the words of Jesus in John 16, He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Isn't that good news this morning? Amen. You see, following Jesus doesn't mean you'll never falter or fail or fear, but rather in the midst of those realities, you're able to take heart. You're able to rise up. You're able to believe. You're able to trust God. You're able to move forward in Jesus' name. The lives of great Christian leaders and everyday people teach us to follow. In order to follow a God-sized dream, you need a God-sized courage. Yes. Amen. God-sized dream. This church has a God-sized dream. 
There's a God-sized dream that has been lived out for these 37 years. And there's another part, another phase, a whole nother dimension of a God-sized dream that's still yet to come, that's still yet to be manifested in our lives. Psalm 31, 24 says, Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. Do you hope in the Lord this morning? Let me see your hand. Do you hope in the Lord this morning? Absolutely. Amen. Then be courageous. Anytime there's hope in your heart, correct courage should follow. Anytime there's hope in your heart for a better tomorrow or a better future or a better outlook financially or whatever it might be, we have to, when we have hope in our heart, then courage is a necessary ingredient to go along with it. If you haven't discovered it soon, you will. It takes great courage to follow after God's plan. God's plans never come when they're convenient. Right? God's plans never come in convenient moments, during easy times. Voices of opposition, including the devil, people, family, the old, your own voices in your head, sometimes the biggest enemy right there between your ears. Right? They tell you to back up, slow down, reconsider your plan of action. Are you sure about this? I don't know if this is the right choice. And that's why if you're going to obey God, you need courage. Wikipedia defines courage as the ability to confront fear in the face of pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. Wow. Courage is the ability to confront fear in the face of pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. Courage is having the guts to do what needs to be done regardless of the questions you may have or the unanswered parts that you can't figure out. Amen. Just because you have questions doesn't mean we can't do it. Just because we don't know the next steps doesn't mean we can't do it. In spite of the questions, in spite of the feelings, this is what courage does. It enables us to rise up and move forward anyhow. Amen. Without courage, your assignment is crippled. You can have the most crystal clear vision. I mean, it's written down. It's in four phases, and you got it so written out, and man, it's specific steps and timetable and so forth and people that will be involved. But you could have that crystal clear vision, but if there's no courage to go along with it, you'll never step out and do it. It'll look good on paper. It'll sound good in your heart. It sounds good when you tell people about it, but in order to accomplish it, it's going to require courage. Hallelujah. Amen. Quick, three quick insights concerning courage. Insight number one. Courage is not gender specific. It does not require an education, an age limit, or a resume. Every single one of us are capable of transferring courage from God into our everyday lives. It's a virtue. A virtue without it, no other virtues are possible. You could be the most virtuous person in the world, but again, courage is what enables us to step up and step out. It's the only way through fear and obstacles. Let's put it this way. Fear is the stage for courage to act. Without fear, there can be no courage. Why would we need courage if there wasn't fear? Why would we need courage if there wasn't something coming against us? Why would we need courage if it wasn't something trying to stop you? A limitation, whether it's physical or emotional or mental. Fear and uncertainty is the stage where courage shows off, where your courage steps out, where your courage declares, I can do this, even though I have all these limitations, courage rises up and says, come on, we can do this together. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. What would you pursue today if you knew you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't fail? What would you pursue that was, you were, fear trapped you in times past, but now you're realizing that I can do this. And that's why I believe courage is one of the most important leadership traits to possess. Amen. Insight number two, courage is inborn. Courage is not inborn like some personality traits. It's learned. You say, well, I've always been a shy person. I've always been like, I'll be the last person to go. I'm not the first person to step out. I, I'm not like that. I'm not the, the leader that, you know, leads the charge. I'll, I'll, be, I'll back you up, but I'm not necessarily the one that goes first. 
Um, and so we feel like we, we limit ourselves, but we could all learn to be courageous. From a young child, uh, we children expressed and, and, and showed this natural courage. You know, the first time we, they rode their bicycle without training wheels, that took courage. First time they jumped in the deep end without floaties, that took courage. The first time they did, they ice skated without holding onto the rail and let go, right? There's example after example of lessons learned about courage. We learned that progress requires courage. It was the way it was when we were young. It's the way it still is. Amen. We, progress requires courage. And insight number three, courage is feeling fear, but choosing to act anyways. <laughs> uh, take a big gulp on that one, right? <laughs> courage is feeling fear, but choosing to act anyways. Just because you feel fear doesn't mean you quit. Right. How many times have my wife and I, how many times have we in parenting, in our marriage, in our finances, in pastoring uh, for 40 years, for 47 years in ministry, and 48 years almost married. I mean, how many times have we felt fear and moved on anyways and stepped out of it anyways? Sometimes the greatest victories are when the fear is there and you go out, you go after it anyways. Sometimes there's fear in being a tither. But you say, you know what? I'm going to tithe with that fear still there. I'm going to obey God. Amen. Going to church, whatever it might be, joining a team, whatever it is, this fear tends to stop us. But the, but the greatest among us are the ones that feel it, but don't give into it. Yes. I like what nice Nelson Mandela said. He said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. See, each person has a choice to make. You have a choice to make. You can sit on the mountaintop, enjoy the view, or you can roll up your sleeves and get a, have a fresh step into God's plan for your life and experience another level of freedom, another level of the anointing, another level of the presence of God, another level of camaraderie and the, and the synergism that comes together when a body of believers join and get behind their leaders and, and follow through with God's plan. Question for us today, is change, your, is change your friend or your enemy? I pray in Jesus' name it's your friend. Now, I'm not saying it's a friend that'll sit with you and be a pity party, you know. Change is serious. Change as a friend, you know, sometimes that, that friend can kick you in the, in the backside, right? That sharp stick called truth. Amen. And we have a choice to make. It's not, if it's your friend, then it's not going to sit around and encourage you to have some pity. It's going to be encouraging you to be the best that you can for God. If God wants us to see change, as the arrival of opportunity, rather an invasion and destruction. That's what change wants you to understand. When change is your friend, it's the arrival of an opportunity. It's not destruction. It's not like it's the end of the world. It's not like your whole world is going to fall apart. Amen. So we, we need to understand the value of change. We've learned over the years to make sure that change was our friend. Since change is inevitable, why is it that so many people react to it as a threat? In many ways, people live contently and welcome change. You know, they like the latest styles, they, the latest technology, um, the, the more modern ways to you know, make life efficient. So we enjoy those kinds of changes. And so oftentimes we can be double-minded when it comes to change. We want good change to come, but we don't want any change that makes me feel uncomfortable. We don't want any change that makes me feel like, you know, I've got to step up now and I've got to be better at something or I need to improve or I need to go back to school or I need to change my attitude or I need to really make an adjustment in my heart um, and change those things that God's been dealing with me a long time in my life to do. And when change comes into our lives in ways we didn't expect, we take it personally. And the bottom line is we, we, we like change as long as it doesn't cause discomfort. Am I in the right room? Yes. I'll, I'll raise both my hands on that one. You know, I'll do the other foot if I didn't fall over, but it's, we're all there. Yes. 
Every one of us are there. We're all in the same boat together. Every one of us can relate to this. Amen. So because we're so double-minded when it comes to change, we're often not prepared for it. It's not something that most of us feel naturally skilled in. Therefore, we learn that about change the hard way by experience. Change is going to come. And the best way is to accept change rather than fight change. Because the more we fight change, the more at some point we're going to have to say uncle at some point, right? Because change has a way of being very pervasive in our lives so we can, we can welcome it or we can go the hard way or the easy way. <laughs> I found it's better to go the easy way. Amen? Um, here are some different ways we approach change. People watch things happen. There's a group of here, people that, they just watch things happen. They're, they're like kind of passive, indifferent about change, no real interest. There are people who let things happen. They're resigned to the fact, well, it's going to happen anyways. Nothing I can do about this. People ask what happened. These are the clueless ones. Hopefully nobody here is clueless. Uh, not this church. That's the church down the street. Amen. They're clueless. They don't really get what's happening. Never saw it coming. Wow, that was a surprise. People defy what happens. They're resistant to change and tend to live in denial. But then there are those people that make things happen. These are the people of resurrection life that make things happen. These are the people that join teams. These are the people that pray. These are the people that roll up their sleeves. These are the people you see, they got dirt in their fingernails because they're, they're busy working. These are the people that volunteer. These are the people that tithe and give offerings no matter what's going on in their lives. These are the people that, that thank God for his word. These are the people that, that stand. These are the people that, that make things happen. These are the folks that say, we can't live without them. They're the pillars in our church. They're the people that say, you know what, no matter what's going on here, this is my home and I will make a difference. I will do my part to make things happen. That's the kind of people that handle change well. Those are the kind of people, and I believe you are those kind of people that will say, man, whatever it takes, whatever I've been not doing that I need to start doing, it's time now. Amen. The team needs to grow. Things need to happen. As you well know, it's so important that we are the faithful part of a team and we're moving forward in making things happen. Isaiah 43, 19 is the perfect verse of Scripture for what's taking place, familiar to many of you, says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Aren't you glad for that verse? Yeah. My Lord, I, I'm so grateful for that verse. Notice, please, God did not say, back in the day, I did a new thing. Or someday I'll do a new thing. No, he says, I'm doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing here. God is, did you hear me? God is doing a new thing here. Amen. But to experience it, you have to turn your focus away from how you've always lived or how you've always thought onto the now Failing to do so is a life full of disappointment and regret. Again, it says, do you not perceive it? Do you not perceive and know it? And will you not give heed to it? Notice God's already doing a new thing. He's trying to promote us. He's trying to increase us. He's trying to give us more. That's his will to give us more. More of everything. More souls, more people, more lives, more influence in the community, more opportunity, more teens, more young adults, amen, more money to, to do more things, praise God, and to create this environment that, that is healthy and strong. That's God's will. He wants to do this. He wants to do this. He says, do you not perceive it? In other words, are you making room for this new thing? Yeah. Are you making room for this new thing? Or are you just bumping along, going with the flow? Amen. Are you believing for increase? Are you believing to be one of those people that are in the center of the center of God's will? Are you believing to be more effective in, in, in every area, your leadership, your parenting, your friendship, uh, as a child of God? Don't miss what I'm doing, he's saying. Pay attention. Can you hear the alarm going off? Eh, 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 eh. Are you paying attention, resurrection life? 
Do you perceive this? Are you making room up here for this thing? This is bigger than you think. This is bigger than what you can ever imagine. You can, this is bigger than what you could ever think of. See, the wonderful thing about this church is a, an amazing strong foundation has been laid. Your pastors have laid a foundation that is so strong that's able to stand the test of time. Relationships that they have. Foundation is in place. Amen. Amen. You know the taller the building, what? The deeper the foundation. There's a tall building going on this foundation. Amen. There really is. And it's going to take all of us to do this. This is an invitation from God to step up out of the old into the new. Don't be distracted by drama. Don't be distracted by voices surrounding you to miss this new adventure. Oftentimes, the only thing that's standing in the way is our willingness to think differently. That's it. Are you willing to think differently? Are you willing to think outside the box? This works in business. This works in your family. This works in your friendships. This works for you. Amen. God is doing a new thing now. Amen. What I need to do is adapt and adjust so I don't miss the new thing that God so longs to do. Remember, it's a new thing. It's not the same thing. It's a new thing. Not the same, not that, not that what was before or what is now is bad. It's not at all. Are you kidding me? It's not at all. But this is God now. This is how God thinks. It's not the same thing. It's a new thing. Amen. It doesn't mean this won't be challenging. It doesn't mean there won't be spiritual warfare. It doesn't mean that there won't be giants in the land. It doesn't mean it's going to require everything within you to, to rise up and pray and use your faith and stand your ground and, and recognize the bigness of God's plan and don't, don't allow the giants or the, the temptations to, of, of culture, the cultural giants and all the things that are around us to stop us from building this church that will honor and glorify God. Yes. Amen. Amen. The only way for, for you to move forward and get everything you want in life is regardless of circumstances, regardless of it all, Initiate God-inspired changes, changes that honor God and changes that grow you, amen, for his honor and for his glory. Amen. Can I hear an amen today? Amen. Amen. Let me close with a lesson from Gideon that rose up in my heart. And uh, while I was praying, I don't know, a month or so ago, this, this was the first thing that rose up in my heart for this message. And Judges 7, there's an exciting account of Gideon's incredible victory, most of us know about it, over the Midianites that I want us to understand. It's a real story. It's a real story that required faith in action. It reveals the principles that we need during challenging times, during times of change, during seasons of pioneering. And and if we are to be overcomers and not overcome, we need to apply the principles that this lesson about Gideon gives us. Gideon proved to be a worthy leader, so much so that 32,000 soldiers wanted to follow him. That's something. That's absolutely amazing. Now that that army is ready for battle, God begins to give him instructions. And they were very unexpected instructions. Judges 7, 2 and 3, we read them. The Lord said to Gideon, you have way too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites... The Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid and afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of those soldiers left. They went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. Wow, wait a minute. This is preposterous. This is crazy. 22,000 men go home just by saying, if you're afraid, you can leave now. And 22,000 soldiers. Okay, we're not talking just regular people. These are soldiers left. Wow. Now, I'm sure Gideon was tempted to think, come on, God, we're, we're already outnumbered. It's estimated that the Midianites had about, a, about a, you know, 145,000 soldiers. And we were already outnumbered at 32,000. Now we only have 10,000. Well, guess, guess what? God's not done yet. 
Amen. He's not done yet. He goes on to say, let's see. Judges 7, 4, and 6. But the Lord told Gideon, there's still too many. What? Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. The ones who put all those in one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths to the stream. See, God was wanting to find out, okay, you that are afraid, you left. So the fearful ones left. Now he was looking for those who would be alert. Those who would be attentive those that would be not consumed with their own needs, but with the needs of what is facing them, this battle, this enormity that they were about to face. Everyone that got on all fours and, and, and drank, they're not looking at anything. They're concerned about their own needs. They're concerned about themselves. I'm sure it was hot. I'm sure it was in a place where they were extremely thirsty, and they got on it, and they, all they cared about was satisfying themselves. All they were concerned about is satisfying their own wants and wishes. They're the ones that left. But the ones that got down on one knee and brought the water up to them with one hand and lapped it out of their hand, they were the ones that were alert in case the enemy attacked. They were the ones that were uh, alert to know Man, I, want, I need to be sensitive here. I need to recognize this is, this is war territory. This is, a, this is not the same like anything else that we've ever experienced. Amen. See, you have to have the ability to see the big picture. The ones who saw the big picture, the ones who were able to see beyond their own thoughts, their own ideas, the ones who saw beyond and saw the bigger picture that God wanted to do and got a glimpse whether we see it all or not because we need faith to do this. We're not going to see everything, but we can have an expectation in our heart. We can have some, something stirring on the inside. And so they were alert. They had their hand ready with, with the, whatever side their sword was on. They were prepared to fight at a moment's notice, still drinking, still having their needs met, but it was not just about them. Isn't that an amazing point? It was not just about them. And what a great picture of the church. What a great picture of this season. What a great picture. See, though the Midianites' army was vast, 145,000, if Gideon's original army of 32,000 were to conquer them, they would be considered as heroes in the battle, no doubt. If the 10,000 they were reduced to, if they conquered them in spite of such great numerical superiority, superiority the 10,000 would be acclaimed as mighty men of valor. But for 300 men... To defeat 145,000, that could only be considered a miracle, yes. an intervention of God. Amen. Israel had a history of doing things and seeing victories and saying, look at us. Aren't we something? And God could not allow them to have that victory with 32,000 or 10,000 so they wouldn't start that negative pattern of, of thinking they're something else, and it's all about them and their strength. Look what we did. There's no way to have victory with 300 against 145,000. Isn't that an amazing story? Yes. It is so real, and it's so real for us today. Amen. I, I, you know, years ago, I was complaining to the Lord. I'm sure none of you ever done that. I was, I was complaining to the Lord. I was, I was kind of angry, overwhelmed, like, what's going on? This is crazy. Um, one of those seasons where you just, you know that things aren't, seem like they're going right and what's going on here. And I heard the Lord say this in my heart. He said, the odds have always been against the righteous. The odds will always be against the righteous. Get over it. <laughs> wow. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting a hug. Oh, my son, I love you. <laughs> oh, my son's going to be okay. Not get over it. 
meaning that there's always going to be storms. The storm can't be the issue. Your feelings can't be always the final say. Your emotions can't be the final say. The odds have always been against the righteous. The odds will always be against re resurrection life. Get over it, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> I have no problem with Becky. It's just Jeremy that I'm... <laughs> Get over it. Amen. See, you and God always make the majority. Always make the majority. Resurrection life, God is calling you to a season of pioneering. He really is. Amen. To not allow fear, uncertainty to stop you. Do it afraid if you have to. Just don't let it stop you and, and, and limit you. Listen very carefully. Notice it wasn't the strongest and the bravest that God chose. God chose the ones who would not give in to fear and put their trust in him and were on high alert sensitive to God's instructions. Man, I love that. Because we always think God's going to use the bravest. That's not me. God's going to use the strongest. That's not me. God's going to use the most intelligent. That's not me. God's going to use the ones that have the most memorized scripture. That's not me. God's going to use the one that, man, they pray all oh, with such fervency and, and they're always in the Bible. Oh, okay, not, that might not always be me. And so we think that God can't choose us. But through this process, the bravest and the strongest, where we thought, well, that, he, that dude, he's going to be on the front lines. This one, he's going to be right next to Joshua, fighting, this, fighting away. And the surprise of it all was not about that at all. It was about those that would be willing to never give in to fear. Feel it, but don't let it rule you. And they're sensitive to God's will and God's plan. I mean, that's the people I'm looking at this morning. That's the people I'm looking at this morning. That's who you are. God would never bring you this far without you having what it takes on the inside of you. Having it takes that God has already uh, equipped you and there's potential yet unlived inside of you that God wants to bring out of you for such a time as this. Several years ago, the Lord dropped this phrase in my heart. We don't fear the future, we pioneer it. We don't fear the future, we pioneer it. It might be a good phrase for you to write down. I don't fear the future. I pioneer it. Amen. Resurrection life, we don't fear the future. We pioneer it. Amen. Amen. You're pioneers. Amen. You're not going to settle for being a settler. You're a pioneer. And my last verse as I close today, Hebrews 13, 6. Man, what a great verse of Scripture for all of us to stand on and believe. Amplified classic, it says, for he, God himself, has said. I didn't say this. Pastor Jeff didn't say this. Pastor Jeremy didn't say this. God said this. I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down. Relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is our helper. We will not be seized with alarm. We will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to us? Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. We all have to answer the question today. Is change your friend or your enemy? We have to determine... Are we going to let fear rule us? Are we going to be selfish? Are we just going to think about ourselves? Doesn't mean that God doesn't want to take care of you. Absolutely does. But what's going to be required in this new season? What's going to be required in this transition on all parties? Everyone, from leadership to every single person in this room. Amen. And those that will listen to this message later on, online, right? That this is going to require each one of us to say, and, and some might say it by faith, change is my friend. In saying that, you're acknowledging God. In saying that, you're acknowledging that God is your helper. You're acknowledging the fact that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will not, I will not, I will not. Is he making an emphasis there or what? Amen. He promises he won't. And especially if you declare 
that I'm going to be alert and sensitive. I'm not going to give in to my own feelings. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. Yes, you're going to miss Pastor Jeff. And yes, thank God he's not going to some other remote part of the world. It's only Georgia. <laughs> right? It's only Georgia. And you'll see him often, I'm sure. But the fact remains is that even though, yes, you're going to miss your shepherds of, of all these years. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Uh, we would think otherwise if you didn't think that way. But, but that's not going to paralyze us to say, you know, I can't move forward. And we're going to recognize that God knows exactly what he's doing. Yes. God has placed a couple in this midst that have been faithful for over 20-some years. Yes. Amen. This is a son and a daughter of the house. Yes. This is a son and a daughter of the house. Right? These are people that are the real deal and have families that influence them and cause them to grow. And you have you know, spoken to their lives and you have encouraged them and you have challenged them and you have loved on them and cared for them as you have and rightly so, uh, as you have with your pastors. And we, we thank God for that. We really do. As I said, there's a strong foundation here. It has stood the test of time. It really has. And now it's time to build on it. Now it's time to build on it. Doesn't mean you haven't built. Yes, you have. But now it's time to put some, another 10 or 20 floors, yes. right? Now it's time to go a little higher. And now it's time to go a little deeper. The deepness God has done, now it's time to build. Now it's time to get out that sword and that trowel, right? That, that, that um, Nehemiah had when he was rebuilding the walls. Amen. We're going to do some fighting because there's some giants in the land. And we're going to do some building as we fight because God's grace is upon you. Did you learn something today? Are you glad you came to church? Amen. I'm going to close in prayer, and then Pastor Jeff will come and close the service, but let me pray for you today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless this congregation today. I bless them for their faithfulness. I bless them for their sticking it out and, and pressing forward through COVID and through family issues and through all kinds of trials and tribulations. I bless them today. I am grateful for each one of them. They're still standing today. They wondered if they would. And some I feel today, I wonder if I still can. But God's grace is sufficient for you. I pray, Father, this word has encouraged, this word has stiffened up weak knees, straightened out backs and put our head forward and lifting it high to say, glory to God, our best days are right ahead of us. Yes. Glory to God, the best is here. Yes. It's here and it's yet to come. Yes. And Father, we're so grateful for the hard work that Jeff and Debbie and the team have done all these years. Thank you for their faithfulness. And, and their reward is even greater yet still. Amen. Because there's still much work to do through them. Amen. We're grateful for that. And Father, we're so grateful for Pastor Jeremy and Becky and their family, the grace that's on them now to begin to take up this torch, take the baton, and run with it. Run strong and run tall and run with force and run with direction and energy and anointing and the grace of God, that mighty empowerment to do the will of God. I thank you, Father, for rallying the troops around them in Jesus' name. I thank you that we, our words, our gifts, our, our, our phone calls, our texts, our telephone calls, our, our emails will only be that of uplifting and encouraging and come alongside and, and hold up their arms for the honor and glory of God. What exciting days for resurrection life. Oh, my goodness. Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And we thank you for it because you're the only one that's worthy of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. You know, sometimes people leave church and they say, that was a good word. And I want you to know this wasn't a good word. This was a God word. And this is what God do, does through Pastor Jonathan and Verna everywhere they go, whether it's from the front or whether it's in a conversation or prayer. 
they have such a heart after God that they make themselves available. And today, they made themselves available to God and to you to give us as a body what the Bible calls the rhema word of God, the sword of the spirit. God's given you a weapon today. If you leave it behind, that's you. Don't let go of this. Hang on to this knowing that God knows the battles that are ahead because you are going to face battles, just like going into the promised land, they face battles. But God told them before they went in, I've given you the land. Everywhere your foot treads, I've given you that. And he's given you everything you need, especially through these two that are going to lead you in this victory because God has a plan and it goes from glory to glory, ever increasing. And he is doing that. And right now, I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person here, those that are online, those that will hear this in the, the weeks, months, and years to come. Father, I thank you that you seal this to our heart. That, Father, we would continue to draw close to you, and as we do, we are drawn closer to each other. That, Father, we would be those that don't break ranks, that our eyes are on you, our ears are attentive to you as you speak through the leaders in this church. We thank you for the gift of Pastor Jeremy and Becky. We thank you for the wisdom and the guidance and the understanding and the discernment that you continue to give to them. And Lord, give it to us too as we commit ourselves to fulfilling the part you have for each one of us. And Lord, we just want Jesus to be lifted up in our lives, in this place, in this community, in this county, in this state, in this country, and in this world. Because Father, you have called Resurrection Life Church to be a local body with global influence. And we thank you, it's only gonna increase. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And help us realize what our part is. The part you have for us, not the part we want. Because you know better than we do what's best. We thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You know, I don't want to miss the opportunity. If you're here and you have never realized the importance of, of not doing life alone. That's why the Bible says God places the solitary in families. And this is a family. This is a family that's ever growing. And whether you're here in person or you're online or you're listening to this at a, another time, know that you can join the family. God is waiting with open arms, but he's not gonna force us to come home. He's waiting for us to turn to him and trust in him. And as we do, he does this miraculous work that happens in a life that only God can do. He takes our life that is dead in uh, sin and trespasses and causes us to be alive to him and connected in his kingdom and in his body. And so today, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads. If you're here and you have never turned your life over to the Lord, or if you're online and you're hearing this and you're saying, wow, you know, I feel so isolated, so alone, and I need to be connected in a family and in a kingdom that's victorious and glorious. Today is your opportunity. And I'm just gonna invite everyone here to pray. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who came into this world, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay the price for my sin, and conquered hell and death in the grave was raised to the right hand of the Father God in heaven. Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Govern me. Guard me. Guide me. 
For you, Lord, are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you today for saving me, cleansing me, and causing me to be a new creation in Christ. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer here for the first time or you recommitted your life to the Lord, let somebody know. If you prayed online, go to the website reslifeny.org. Go down to where the prayer requests are. Let us know that you prayed today. If you want us to be able to pray for you by name, let us know what your name is. And if you want us to contact you, give us some contact information. Hey, church, you have a great week ahead of you. It's not because school is off, all right? Mom and dads, you're like, okay, we've got a week. We'll, we'll, we'll endure it. But it's because God has a plan. And he's gone ahead of you and prepared the way. He's provided blessings that you're going to run into. But he's going to also give you opportunities to impact the people that he so loved he gave his son for. Be attentive. I just want to share this before we go because it just happened last night. We were driving home having been to dinner with Pastor Jonathan and Vernon, Pastor Jeremy and Becky, and we were driving into our driveway, and there was a car that was following us. It was our neighbor. Now, I have had very few words with him. They just haven't been available. They stopped at the end of our driveway, and he got out, and he was coming towards me, and, and man of faith, what's going on? <laughs> But he came over and he had this look on his face. And he said, are, are you having services tomorrow? This man has never talked to me about the Lord or anything. And I, I did, it would so shock me, I, it didn't register. And I was like, what? He said, are you having services tomorrow? I said, yes, sir, we are. He said, would you pray for my Kathy? I said, what? Would you pray for my wife? She's in hospice and she's not going to make it. And at that moment, this man's heart was open to something I don't even know if he knows anything about. But he knows this was beyond him. And he was reaching out for something that he knew that somehow we had. And I'm asking you to pray for him, pray for his wife, pray for his family, pray first of all for their salvation, but also recognize there are people everywhere we go that are in needs like this, and they need to know that there's somebody there that knows somebody that can do something about it. And you are those people. And so I just want to close today praying for you and praying for them. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person here today, every person online, and every person that will hear this. Father, I thank you that you are with us and for us. You go ahead of us and prepare the way, and you're our rear guard. You uphold us with your right hand of righteousness, and you have a plan for us that never, never, never changes. It's for good, not for evil with a future and a hope, that we would be the glorious, victorious church. And Father, for all those that we know and all those that we're going to come to know and interact with, like Dr. Muddy and his wife, Father, his family, help us to be aware and sensitive and available to the myriad of opportunities around us. And Father, we pray for them that they would know who Jesus is they would receive his lordship, that heaven would be their home. Father, continue to bring people across their paths and use us, use us and help us not to be so busy, so scheduled that we're not available to you because that's what we're here for. We thank you, Father, for their salvation. We thank you for the salvation of family members and friends and strangers that you'll give us the opportunity to minister to. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. have a great week.